I'm Aria Schwartz, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. This episode, we're talking about my hometown team, the Minnesota Lynx, with Windsider Lynx beat reporter, Danny Barlavi. If you like our show, please consider joining our Patreon community, patreon.com backslash Winsider. For less than a cup of coffee a month, you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the W. And don't forget to see our amazing staff's written content on winsider.com. That's winsider.com. And remember, downloading the episode makes our stats look better, allows us to continue doing this important work, and it enhances your listening experience. Speaking of winsider.com and our amazing staff and our amazing written content, Excited to welcome Danny to the show, but before we get started, say hi to the folks and tell them where they can see your Twitter ramblings, your writings, and all the different stuff you're doing regarding the WNBA. I love how you always say Twitter ramblings, because it's so true uh, for whoever you have on. That's just all Twitter is. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, my uh, Twitter is at dblfluidity, uh, and I mostly tweet about basketball. Paul, but you know, Twitter. I occasionally just go off about something else if I want to. Um, but yeah, other than that, as you said, uh, I'm covering the Minnesota Lynx for Winsider this season, which has been a lot of fun, very interesting. Um, I'm also covering the New York Liberty for Nets Republic. Uh, you can find all my work there on the Liberty tab at NetsRepublic.com. And then I've also been roaming the league for uh, Venus Sports who are my OGs, the first people who let me write about the WNBA on the internet, uh, as well as Clean Ballers Club, uh, where I'm doing a balance of things from uh, player profiles that integrate biographies and uh, stats uh, and game breakdown, as well as just stuff like, uh, you know, what's everyone, what's your favorite player's hobby? Um, so yeah, those are my four somehow websites I write about for the, uh, write about the WNBA for. I like how you said the first place that allowed me to write about the as if there was no like one else a, would. Yeah, <laughs> like there was like a rule on the internet. Danny can yeah, not write hole. about. You can do anything else, just not write about the W until someone yeah, lets but, you. So yeah, they broke that barrier for me. So <laughs> hey, shattering ceilings, whatever it is. Yeah. So let, let's talk about this Lynx team. I mean, we could, we could go on a, a variety of different paths with this. So we tried mm-hmm. to to lay this out in a sense making format which rarely happens on this show it rarely happens in my life but i mean i'm just curious your initial thoughts i'm going to give you a couple of my thoughts then we'll kind of go from there i mean teams on a five game win streak they're fourth Mm -hmm. place in the league the offense is flowing i've lost count how many times i've said this team looked like five individuals playing basketball not a team right it looked like a pickup game and honestly sometimes as ridiculous as it this sounds like Pickup teams might be a little bit better than this team was looking at some points, right? Because you're just flowing. Um, but it, there's there's a lot of interesting aspects, and, and I'm guilty of this, of it being my hometown team. So I have a soft spot for it, right? So I can be a little bit extra critical, uh, but then on the, on the flip side, be a sucker uh, to fall for some things with this team. So I'm excited to kind of chat with you as I feel like you're entering that same realm probably as a reporter covering the team, getting closer to the team, it kind of pulls you in that same way what are your thoughts about this team uh what we've seen over the past few games and just kind of where they are as of today july 8th you know it's it's so funny because i, I did come into this season uh i'm not I, i'm not a uh Lynx fan although i've kind of, you know i've i've become one just as you said over the course of just getting to know these people getting to know these players these coaches like you want them to succeed <laughs> obviously you know them but yeah, uh, in ter- speaking of which, the last five games have been really good with that respect. Um, one thing I've been really excited to see kind of turn around over that stretch, uh, I kind of, we kind of saw a bit of it last night, but overall they've been better about their turnovers, um, which I've been really happy to see because my last Winsider article was about how that was hurting them. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I really think that you saw a lot of, um, I mean, it's it's what you said that you saw a lot of the links playing 
for, for themselves and not really communicating as much in the earlier stretch of the season, especially for those first few weeks after all those injuries happened and everyone was pretty discombobulated. But you've, what, what, what you've really begun to see now in terms of getting rid of those turnovers is just communication, obviously. They, they're playing like they trust each other a lot more. And also just in terms of, you know, schematic on-court stuff, um, just playing with a lot more motion. Uh, which is something that uh, Coach Reeve highlighted to me after a game a, a couple of nights ago. I forget which game it was after, but just, um, yeah, just playing. There, there was a lot before of just players trying to um, get the ball inside because it was working for Fee or working for Sill. The Fee's a call here, so it'll be a foul for the uninitiated. Um you know, just uh, you, you saw a lot of players just um, on the perimeter holding the ball over their head, communicating the fact that they were going to pass it inside. And then, you know, it becomes easier at the, as the other team to get the deflection, the deflection in those scenarios. Whereas now you're seeing a lot more of the guards penetrating and kicking out and, you know, really getting things going in motion. Yeah, like a real yeah. flow of offense. Yeah. Right? Like. I love that that you brought that up because something that I've I, a, a a bone that I've had for a little bit, and you know this goes back a few seasons. So I'm not going to punish you for not being a Lynx beat reporter a few seasons ago. But you know when the dynasty broke up, yeah. um, it became very apparent not just. You know, we all knew how good Sylvia Fowles was, and everybody else on that roster, Lindsey Whalen, Simone Augustus, Maya Moore, Rebecca Brunson, got to shot them all out. Um, but what wasn't as apparent was little things like that, right? When you think about a good player, you think about them hitting shots, making smart basketball decisions, uh, smart times to foul, playing good defense, things like that, like things we can all see and notice. Things that aren't often thought about and talked about when it comes to skilled basketball players is their ability to, and and I don't want to overly simplify this, but just feed the bigs down low. Yeah. And it became so apparent how good Simone, Maya, and Lindsay were about feeding. And, and honestly, Renee Montgomery and all the other, you know, guards that they brought in over those seven years – they were that good at feeding the bigs down low. And, you know, over the last few seasons, I, you know, still obviously we can call it a wash last year, right? But the season before that, you know, and the season before that, it was very much so like it was an obvious struggle that these players didn't know where to feed Sill the ball. Like what yeah. kind of, you know, in a football sense, what's the range of catch of the wide receiver? Um mm -hmm. And we saw that very much so early on in the season, but that has shifted. Now we see that cohesion, that trust, that learning. And I think that's something, you know, yeah, we can just say feeding the ball down low to Sylvia Fowles. Sylvia Fowles is an amazing player, a, a, yeah. an MVP, someone who is, you know, leading the league in multiple statistic categories so far in this season and honestly not getting enough attention about it. No, not at but, all. Right, like, right. Everyone's talking about okay, Tina Charles. Yeah, she's dropping a bunch of points, but what else is she doing? Yeah, I, right. Like, no disrespect Tina, to Tina for yeah, me. I'm, but... and I'm not. I'm not disrespecting, but I'm saying like, if we're gonna talk about a team that for all right, whatever. I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of Tina Charles. No, no. But um, I, I agree with you. I mean, so so is affecting the the game in a lot of ways on both ends of the floor. She's the anchor for the links on both ends of the ball. She's been their best player over the the stretch where they've come back. Um, so obviously, there's been a lot of contributions from a lot of players in turning the season around. I don't want to downplay any of that, but I think they would also all agree. I mean, like, this has been Phil's year. And if the Lynx can, I mean, the Lynx were, what, a, a, the 10th team in the league a couple of weeks ago, and they're up to fourth now. Like, right. That's, that to me is a lot of value, possibly the most value that a player can have. Yeah. And and yeah. and the 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 craziest part in my mind is we're talking about a player who's obviously leading this team right in in many fashions. Kayla many McBride, ways. who I for a very long time is called the poor man's Maya Moore, <laughs> and that's not even like an in, right. That's not like a lot of people. I think when I say that they chuckle, they're like, "That is that insulting to K Mac? Is that not like what does that mean?" 
I honestly think it's a compliment, right? If if we can make an easy argument, Maya Moore is the greatest player of all time in WNBA history. So if I'm talking about you being a slightly lesser version of the greatest player of all time, that's like shooting for the moon and ending up in the stars or whatever the phrase is, right? Yeah, I mean, people people say the same thing about players in the NBA and being, you know, like a lesser Michael Jordan, and that is not a, not an insult. Um, speaking of K-Mac, though, I mean, she's obviously been so huge over this, this stretch of games, and I, I just wanted to give her her flowers because this has been a tough season for her. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, get, we'll there. get there. We'll get there. Let, We're getting right. way ahead of ourselves. We right. are. Yeah. Let's, let's dive in. All right. We got, yeah. we got a four point system going here right now. Um, point number one, the weakness of this team. Shout yeah. out to you because you pointed it out. And I personally just want to give you a shout out and uh, Mitchell Hansen a shout out because we have our little links collective in our oh, Slack yeah. where we're always like, oh my God, did you see this? And just talking and bouncing ideas off each other. And I think it's great, at least for me, I don't know, maybe it brings no benefit for you, but it's great for me to kind of have two other people who are closely following this team and just discuss things. And I'll be completely honest, you guys are much more aware of the quotes and the post game pressers than I am. It's hard for me to, you know, zone in on each team. Um, yeah. And and I have just reaped the benefits of having much wiser people educate me on my hometown team. So it's been awesome. But I want to give you props because you and you have been preaching the turnovers, the turnovers, the turnovers. Talk to me about the weakness of this team, which we have dubbed the turnovers. Yeah, I mean that absolutely. And I think every single player on that roster, and I think that Cheryl Reed would agree that, that absolutely has just been the kind of the one. The, the one huge snag in the machine that is the Minnesota Lynx, because like Reeve actually pointed out to the, the, pointed this out to me a couple of games ago that since, uh, since I think the end of May, this team has been top in three point percentage in effect, like an effective field goal rating and a lot of these offensive advanced stats and normal stats that people swear by as metrics of offensive success, they were there. Their offensive rating was up. I think it was top. I think it's top three in that stretch since May ended. Um, but we still weren't seeing consistent games and consistent wins until these last five games because of these turnovers. It was. I, I think Cheryl Reeves said it was the one drag on the offensive rating. The fact that the team just, um, you know, couldn't stop turning the ball over and uh, a lot of. I would say really unnecessary, unforced errors in those turnovers too. Between you know, as I was saying before, the lack of execution on inbounding into the paint, um, the offensive foul stuff like that, um, and and it's funny because like you'll see these games. Last night, uh, actually, their game against uh, the Wings was a great example of this. Y you see these games where the Lynx will turn the ball. Uh, last night, they turned the ball over 11 times in the first half and gave up a huge lead to Dallas because of it. And then they ended up coming out with the win after they only turned it, at, turned it over twice in the entire second half. Only twice in the entire second half. Well, and wait a second. I, I, but I don't have the stat in front of me, but also if my memory serves correctly from last night, most of those first half turnovers came in the second quarter. Like, yeah, the second quarter first was that. Yeah, like the first quarter was just dominant. I zoned out for two seconds. I'll be honest. I was. It was something. It was something like four turnovers in the first and seven in the second. Yeah, it was yes. something like that. Yeah, and 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 then and that's like if you literally you just look at the box score and you add in the turnovers, right? Like if if the box score per quarter of scoring. And you just below that put how many turnovers the team had. It's a pretty obvious. Yeah, it's a pretty equation. stark correlation. Uh, but yeah, when this team isn't turning over the ball over, it, it really changes everything. It becomes the key to their game on both ends of the court because they've been allowing a lot of points off of turnovers in those games where they turn it turn over a lot. Which you know, then you're, you're giving the the other team north of of sixteen or seventeen free points a game. But also just uh, you, you see the offense really kick into gear when they stop turning the ball over. They, you see, you know, that they're finding better shots and they're making those shots because there's a rhythm there and because there's consistency and momentum. 
And, you know, it's, it's funny because you, we say all these things as analysts and they sound like hot air, you know, you know, what is momentum? What is consistency? It's not um, measurable, but like it, when you look at the, these turnovers and look at the film, it's so clear. Um, but yeah, the, games like this, and the, there was another game, I think against the dream a couple of weeks ago where they just, uh, at, at a certain point in the second quarter, just having turned it over like 15 times, stopped doing it and won the game. Um, and it's funny it, because like, I, I've asked, I've asked Reeve like so many times, how do y'all stop turning the ball over? What do you have to say to these players to stop turning the ball over? And she's always responded just, listen, all you can say is stop turning the ball over. <laughs> there's no trick to it. It's not, it's, there's no cheat code. You just have to stop doing it. You just have to key in and focus and stop doing it. And obviously, as I said, there have been some execution things, the motion offense versus just standing still and holding the ball over their head, huge. But yeah, it's just, it, it's funny to watch this team have these moments where they fall into being the worst turnover team in the league, uh, again, as they were for so much of the season, and then just snap out of it. And, you know, tur two turnovers in, in an entire half of basketball is hard to accomplish. Like, They'll really go from being one of the worst teams in terms of uh, taking care of the ball to the best teams within the course of the game. And it's ridiculous. And obviously, look, to solidify a top team, to solidify a deep playoff run, you need to be on the ladder, right? The yeah. One of those graders. You can't be, you know, the great turnover team and still expect to win. It's like, it's really hard if you're logging, you know, 15 plus turnovers closer to 20 turnovers, over 20 turnovers to win a game. Like, that's not an easy aspect. Let's talk about this offense. Yeah. They have really started to flow. Uh, yeah. You know, we spoke about it earlier, finding ways to get the ball into Sill, um, working as a team, being focused and, you know, goal-oriented as opposed to just a bunch of people running around. An interesting quote that I saw somewhere, and, and I'm not going to give the exact quote, because uh, it's just rambling around in my head, mm -hmm. kind of like that Courtney Williams line about your leg sleeve account. Um, God, but, I have not stopped thinking about that line. But yeah, go on. This is yeah, I know. I, I would never get a tattoo, but if I did, it might be <laughs> on my leg in that. Um, no, it, it's just it's just a great line, and and honestly, it's not a big enough. It hasn't gotten enough attention. Um, but the well, now I completely lost my train of thought. But something you that I've noticed. Yeah, uh, a, a little stat that I was going to drop, not just that this team is, is a cohesive unit, um, but I asked you, the Twitter fans, you know, got any questions for us on this podcast? And just an interesting thing that someone pointed out was uh, the overall net rating of the Minnesota Lynx is ranked sixth overall. But yeah. if you compile that down to just the fourth quarter, they are clearly the number two team just behind the Las Vegas Aces mm -hmm. and above the Dallas Wings who obviously Arike has a huge aspect of that. But just this offense, the way it's flowing, the way that, you know, we're finally starting to see the threats, right? You can feed the ball down into Sill. And if Sill starts cooking, then the defense kind of needs to tighten up and clinch into the paint a little bit more, which allows for Caleb McBride to start hitting those shots better. Oh, yeah. uh, Demiris Dantas to start hitting those shots better. Uh, Nafisa Collier, when she gets going, she did not have a great game last night, but when she gets yeah. going, um, that's another player in the paint. Honestly, she's all over the place, but like, yeah, the, no, she is, she, on her best night, she is a true three level scorer. It's been amazing to see that, um, it's, happen this year. Yeah. And, and obviously look like her, her three point percentage is down a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have that right in front of me, but that I, if yeah. I remember correctly, um, but just really interesting to see how this team is flowed. And honestly, a huge aspect of it has to go to Lasia Clarendon. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, you you know very well how I feel about Lay. Um. And, and, well, I just want to take this moment because it's very publicized how I feel about Lay and how I have for years been talking about how I'm not a fan of, of their style of game, how I question whether or not they could be a starter in this league. I've been very open about that. I'm also very open to say I have been proven wrong. Yep. Right? Like, when uh -huh. when Lay joined the Lynx, I believe I messaged you. I was like, I'm yeah. explicit, explicit, expletive, expletive, expletive. Like, why are we doing this? It makes no sense. It's another, you know, 
Cheryl Reeve going out there and getting a vet who there's aspects you like, but then there's just some head scratchers. Just, like, just straight up, I'm confused. Um, but her consistency, the way that he has, you know, attacked the paint, and I, 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 this is our second recording of this because I, my Wi-Fi cut out, so we had to start over again. So I don't remember if it was in this one or the original one, letting everyone behind the curtain. Uh, but we were just talking about the ability of this offense to get into the paint and kick out and create open shots for other players on this team. Yeah, that's all Leisha. I mean, like, that's, that's all Leisha doing it and, uh, you know, executing that themselves, but also setting that example. Um, and, and we talked about that a little bit when I was uh, preparing to uh, write that article about like a couple of weeks ago, which everyone listening to this should read. Um, <laughs> Not should read, but, has to read. Has to, must read. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like, what when, when they first joined this team, I was really excited. A, because I, I, as I said at the top of the show, I also covered the Liberty. I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to talk to my favorite player anymore, and I have been. Um, and so on a personal level, that's been very nice for me. But also, um, yeah, I was very excited for the leadership that they were going to bring to the team on the court and off. This, like, at the moment that the Lynx signed Lay, I, I think that it was like they were on a two or three game losing streak. Just, like, haven't looked like it's honestly, like, I was beginning to get worried that this was going to be a very depressing season to cover because the players were looked a little bit listless. Every obviously it's the Lynx. Everyone still wanted to win. But you know, really mustering that will and executing was a problem. And I think in in terms of both of those things, in terms of keeping the morale alive off the court and also just as I said, uh being vocal on the court setting an example with their play on the court um, of just how to have a successful motion offense and how to uh, all of that. I I was excited, but I I would say even for me, who is like maybe one of Lace's biggest fans, I've been really impressed with how they played this season. Like I, I, I would not have called a 20 point game for Lacey Clarendon when they joined this team. And that's that's on me. Because they they have shown that they're more capable of doing that. Um and having those nights where they just, you know, play really physical and really, you know, get into the paint and get those layups and their shot gets going and their scoring threat. Um but yeah, I, I'm I'm kinda losing my track just being excited about lay. Um but <laughs> No, because yeah. I mean what 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 Lay has been able to do has been so important because of yeah. it places everybody else on the roster into the spot the the role that they need to be for this team to be successful. Rachel Bannum coming off the bench mm-hmm. as a tempo scoring threat. They need that. They don't. They can't. The, the reason the Lynx have been a dynasty is because they were able to plug players into specific roles. And yeah. what was happening before Lay joined the team was players were being asked to do some stuff outside of their skill set to best yeah. perform. And, you know, it, I, it real does, quick. Yeah, it, yeah, it makes me. Uh, I'm sad that the only real uh, minutes we've seen from Ariel this year have been at the point. Um that that is an unfortunate kind of casualty of the that early season figuring things out is that we only got a couple of minutes of Ariel Powers playing in position for the Lynx this year so far. Yeah, but I mean that's injury wise. Right? Yeah, also, so no, that's 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 two compounding factors working together there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the honestly, the biggest disappointment of this season that's kind of getting brushed under the rug is Crystal Dangerfield. I mean, I, we don't necessarily need to do a whole breakdown of that. I'll, no. I'll just ask you your quick thoughts. For me, honestly, it's as simple as her confidence doesn't look to be there. I think early on some shots didn't fall, um, and it it just looks like it has compounded over and over and the confidence just isn't there it's um you know it's interesting because things seem so good for crystal coming off the bench initially when she first got moved back there after after Mm -hmm. the first game like she really was thriving in that um 
you know, microwave off the bench roll where she would like watch the game for half of the first quarter and then come out and start scoring and start playmaking. Um, like she was looking great early on. Um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, the minutes have slipped. Uh, there, there's been less time for her to get her shot going consistently. And she's definitely a player who thrives off of seeing the ball go in and, you know, uh, score, you know, shooting in volume and getting her shot going. Um, yeah, I, 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 I was actually thinking last night about how much I wish that I, I, that we as a Lynx press corps, like, got a chance to talk to Crystal right now because it's been a while since we've had her on availability either. But yeah, I, I would just love to know where she's at, how she's feeling about her game. Because, you know, it's it's so hard to make that call about the confidence just by watching her on, on the bench yeah. and on the floor. Um, but that makes sense to me. Well, when I yeah. say, what I'll say is like, when I'm saying confidence, I'm not speaking anything to body language of when, excuse me, they're on the court. And I don't mean body language like her head's down and, you know, this negative. No, I'm not talking about all that, the negativity that goes with it. What I'm talking about is, there's been multiple times like I've lost count of the times where I'm looking at the game and crystal from last year, she would have shot that. Yeah. Maybe it goes in, maybe it doesn't, but she would have shot that. And what I'm seeing is her get into the motion and there's that clearly like wheels churning. Am I going to shoot it? Am I not? Do I want to like, there's just too much thinking going on, second guessing, whatever it is. And, and again, that's not me based off speaking to her. That's me based off watching her game and seeing the confidence that I saw exuding on the court last season compared to her body language and what's exuding from her right now. And and I don't think there's much more that we can talk in about that, but I want to yeah. talk about defense real quick. Sure. Um, defense has been a thorn for this team, right? There's mm-hmm. the quote beginning of the season. Uh, we're not going to be an elite defensive team from Cheryl Reeve. It's stuck yep. in my head. It's living rent free also. But slowly, this team has started to take a lot more pride in their defense, right? I saw some yeah. great quotes uh, that you put out last night from K-Mac just about, you know, her ability to to spot up on Arike, to spot up on Diana Taurasi, and other great scorers in this league and the impact that's had. And she also, Sil- She's done a great job of that this week, yeah. Yeah, and Sylvia yeah. Falls, too. Honestly, oh, like, man. part I mean- of what Sill has done, it's not just the offense side. It's like Sill arguably is up there for defense player of the year right now. I think I think she should be uh I think she should be the leading candidate. I, I don't really understand the arguments I've seen for other people. I actually I forget who, but uh, someone did like a way too early uh def- full defensive team and they had Sill second team all what? all WNBA. And that I just think is crazy. I like that. That that to me is offensive. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Like, and I, agree. I, I get it. I get it's also a positional thing, and they had another center up there, and they can only have one center or whatever. But what center was above? I don't remember. I mean, I, it might have been. It might have honestly been John Paul Jones, who isn't even playing center this year. Huh. <laughs> Well, all right, all right. We'll, we'll we'll get to that later. But yeah. I mean, no, that's a whole other can of worms. But anyway, yeah. speaking of still, speaking of still as herself and not in, in comparison to other players, as I'm sure she'd prefer we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, she's been she's always been an amazing defender. She's always been one of the best lockdown post defenders in terms of just denying people at the rim and like and you know. But what's really impressed me this year is the fact that at uh, in her age 35 season, she's completely added a new dimension to the way that she plays defense this year. She's never been the, you know, she's always been good at deflections and good at steals and good at, good at denying people entry into the post. But she's, I, I would say, the best center doing that right now. Is she still, I want to grab the exact uh, steals per game metric right now. You pull that up because well, while you're pulling that up, I mean, yeah. what I've seen from her is that anchor, right? You yeah. need an anchor defensively so that your guards can play a little bit more aggressive. When K-Mac knows that she has Sylvia Fowles behind her, that gives yeah. her the opportunity to be a little bit more aggressive offensively 
or sorry, defensively against the Ooh. offense and do some things that just, you know, maybe you're second guessing. And I think that that will get into our last point that we'll touch on spe- uh, quickly. But uh, if you have that stat for us, drop it on us. Oh, yeah, she is. It was way higher earlier in the season, uh, too, but it's still her career high at 2.1 steals per game. Um, her previous career high was below one and a half. So, I, I mean, like, that's almost an entire other steal per game above her career high. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's when you see Sil go against these other great centers, and, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because it's exactly what we were talking about for the Lynx and their turnovers. But when Sil can also make sure that the other center can't get the ball, the way that um, some teams have been able to force the Lynx to not, you know, been able to prevent the Lynx from getting the ball into Sil. Um, but, yeah, her ability to just lock down the paint in that way and make sure that it's, it's just not happening. It's not even about defending the rim because it's just not happening. There's going to be a deflection. They're going to get in transition. Yeah. And, w- and when they get those, you know, transition buckets. That's when this team is, it, that's when like, this team looks so dangerous. When they yeah. have like 20 transition points, it's like, I want to say in the history of the Lynx, they have three losses. Some, something crazy yeah. like that. But, no, it's something like that. I mean, that's a huge part. Even And even going back to the dynasty days, obviously, that's always been a huge part of this team's identity and the way that Cheryl coaches. Um. So yeah, I mean it's it's really really great to see still getting that going and everyone else responding with transition offense and getting those buckets. And when you have a player like that, it builds trust. And it when does. You have, yeah, and also, have, yeah. I mean, like speaking of building trust, it's not just her play on the court that does that. She is one of the nicest people in the WNBA. I mean, there's yeah. a reason that they all call her Mama Sill. Like, she is this consummate warm. Co- like confidence building leader who trusts you. Um, She's and, just yeah. a giant hug, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, 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 we've talked about still a lot. I want to talk about what, what still has done has had a ripple effect through the rest of the team. And one of the other yeah. players who has really stepped up. And one of the things that we've seen is like, you know, this team struggled early on. Then still had those couple ridiculous, right? They were, you know, win a couple, mm-hmm. lose a couple, whatever. Sill has those ridiculous two games and kind of in the shadow of Sill was Nafisa Collier. Yeah. Right. While, while Sill was having those great games, Fee was also having those great games. And that's kind of like the one, two punch. A great team needs a one, two punch of one oh, player yeah. who's kind of the center stage, but then you need the backup guitarist, the backup vocals. Um, yeah. Oh yes. Oh, Fee is such a rhythm guitarist. Not to oh, say yeah. that she, not to say that she won't one day be the franchise player of the team because she clearly will, and like arguably already kind of is. But um, yeah, I mean, just like her temperament, her uh, lack of ego, all of that. She's such a rhythm guitarist. That's such a good way to put it. Oh yeah, and but but the beauty is, is when Fee's having those off nights, right? The past couple of games haven't been Fee's greatest. K Mac. Yeah. Mac comes in, somebody else steps up, filling that Maya Moore role, right? In the same sense of, you know, Sill was crushing it, and maybe Simone was doing it, and then Maya would take over for one game, and then Maya has a couple off games, Sil, or Simone takes over, or maybe Waylon does. That's how great teams do it. You know, uh, I know you know the stats. Can, can you just run down what K-Mac has done? She's made nine shots in the last three games. She's yeah, scoring. Yeah, she's actually, she's... Exactly nine of thirteen in each of the last three games, which is really interesting. Um, just from a number nerd perspective, that is very, very literally consistent. Um, but yeah, she's scored above uh, twenty-one points three times in a row the first time in her career, uh, which I was surprised by. Um, but yeah, I mean, like all while holding uh, Arike and Diana below 15 points in each of those matches too, which is not easy. But yeah, I mean, you said before it's a one-two punch and the way this team plays sometimes, it can really feel like more than that. It can be like a one, two, three, four punch. Yeah. And yeah. But that's, that's the scary part too, is because, you know, you need a powerful one, two, but you still need those jabs of the three, oh, four. Yeah. So, like, even if Fee isn't having a great night scoring offensively and she's not being that power, that number two punch or the number one punch, 
she's still putting in work. She's still doing the important things. That's something that I, yeah. I constantly stress. And honestly, it's, it's I, hilariously ironic. Um, just thinking of, the the eye opening experience of Lay joining the Minnesota Lynx and the reason mm-hmm. is because I have stressed for so long. It's not about having the most all stars, the most MVPs, the best players. It's about having the players that fit together best and that yeah. can play off each other best. And that's literally what Lay is doing with this team, which is so oh, yeah, ironic. She... That I'm yeah. So yeah, I mean she is. Um... I keep talking about the the Lynx as a, a machine, but it, it felt like there was a gear missing that made all the other gears turn. And yeah. all the other gears are really great gears, don't get me wrong. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Lay was that missing puzzle piece. And, you know, I there there was a bit of uh, growth for her, for her, obviously, in coming into this team. Uh, they had to learn how to play with Syl. Uh, Cheryl was actually just talking to me about that the other day about how, uh, for they, they were one of the people that were, you know, not passing the ball high enough or whatever to fouls and getting those turnovers. And now, you know, they've learned how to play with Phil and they're the best inbounds passer on the team. But yeah, um, I, I can't talk enough about how good Lay has looked on Minnesota. That could have been the whole podcast, honestly. <laughs> by how good they've looked in Minnesota and how good they've made everyone else look too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to remind everyone, you want to sponsor an episode of the Winsider show, email us info at winsider.com. Again, that's info at winsider.com. Winsider is your one-stop shop for all your WNBA news and conversation, but we can't do without your help. Become a subscriber at patreon.com backslash Winsider for just a few dollars a month. You can help grow the game. Any final thoughts? I'll give you one final thought about the Minnesota Lynx uh, as we have a little bit more time for the Olympic break. Can I actually give a quick shout out to one of our patrons? Heck yeah. 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 Um, My friend Grace has listened to the show way longer than I've been involved in Windsider, way longer than I've known what Windsider is, actually. Uh, She was a huge part of, in college, helping me get more into the WNBA and is a huge supporter of the show. So thank you, Grace. Hey, Grace, shout out to Grace. Yeah. Shout out, shout out. Cause you know what? We appreciate you. You're, you're, you are the lazy Clarendon. You make our wheels turn, right? <laughs> like we, I, I say it and it sounds cheesy or whatever, but literally we are not able to provide the coverage and do the things we do. Uh, if it isn't for our, very kind very thoughtful subscribers so we do appreciate you and thank you and danny thank you yeah no thank you for having me on this is so fun i enjoy this chat we'll definitely have to uh talk more yes we'll chat more all right you have a great rest of your day you too take care